set of pictures. The teacher asks, do you have a question, Calvin? And he says, yes, what assurance do I have that this education is adequately preparing me for the 21st century? Am I getting the skills I'll need to effectively compete in a tough global economy? I want a high paying job when I get out of here. I want opportunity. And the teacher says, in that case, young man, I suggest you start working harder. What you get out of school depends on what you put into it. And he says, oh, then forget it. <laughs> he wants the benefits of being educated without learning anything. In the second what Calvin has done is he called a little girl, a neighbor named Susie, some bad names. So then he says, I feel bad that I called Susie's names and hurt her feelings. I'm sorry I did it. And so Hobbes says, maybe you should apologize to her. And he says, I keep hoping there's a less obvious solution. <laughs> Calvin's not happy with the way that he treated Susie. But he doesn't want to do the right thing to be reconciled with her. When doing things our way rules our life, it's difficult to learn the lessons that will best help us with our life. We're kind of blind to them because they're not our way. Psalm 64 has some verses that seem to talk about learning and learning better. Let's read those together. They search for the perfect crown and say, we have perfected a foolproof scheme. Human nature and the human heart are a mystery. But God will shoot them with an arrow. Suddenly they will be struck dead. They will trip over their own tongues. Everyone who sees them will shake his head. Everyone will be afraid and conclude, this is an act of God. They will learn from what he has done. Righteous people will find joy in the Lord and take refuge in him. You might say, wicked people who think they've got a foolproof plan will get their comeuppance from God and be exposed. And sensible people will say, God has a way of dealing with this. The scripture says, be sure your sin will find you out. While well, thinking about learning and education and stuff, we're going to study about a man that's mentioned a couple of times in the Bible named Gamaliel. I don't think I ever heard a sermon about Gamaliel before. Dorothy, did you ever hear a sermon about Gamaliel? The most things that people know, if they know anything, is that he was the man who educated Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. I did a deal of studying and stuff. He was a highly ranked Jewish man, so I did a radical thing. I looked at Jewish history. You can find a lot of information that way. Gamaliel was a highly educated Pharisee. He was the president or head of the Jewish council when Herod was asking where Christ was to be born. When you read about the, the, the fellows from the Orient came Three kings, as they call it. That's in Matthew 2. He educated Saul of Tarsus, who was later known as the Apostle Paul. And Gamaliel gave counsel when the apostles were brought before the council with the intention of killing them. Now, having said all that, there's a word. We see it. In our Bibles one time, in John 20, 16, I've got it on the board. The morning of his resurrection, Mary Magdalene remained at the tomb. And she thought the gardener was out there. And she said, could you tell me where you've laid him? 
And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and saw him, and she said, Rabboni, or Rabboni, I don't know, because I'm not Jewish, which is to say, great teacher. The great one, the great teacher. I always thought the heart of the word rabbi meant teacher. But the heart of the word rabbi means great. So to the Jewish person, a person who was highly educated about the law of Moses and their huge encyclopedic volume of customs was a rabbi, a great teacher. Rabboni was one up from that. It was sort of like saying, uh, the teacher's teacher, or the greatest of all teachers, and the first man who ever got that title, according to Jewish history, was Gamaliel. So many years later, when Paul had come back to Jerusalem, and the crowd was trying to tear him apart, and the soldier put him up on the steps, and he got him quieted and spoke to him, he said, I was educated by Gamaliel. This, this is like saying to those people, I was educated by the man you most highly regard of all men living as a teacher of the law. And I never quite understood the depth of impact that would have had. So we're going to look at a couple of these incidents. The first is when the apostles were brought before the Jewish council. The account is in Acts 5, 34 through 40 on this front page. Let's read these verses together. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel stood up. He was a highly respected expert in Moses' teaching. He ordered that the apostles should be taken outside for a little while. Then he said to the council, Men of Israel, consider carefully what you do with these men. Some time ago, Thutis appeared. He claimed that he was important, and about 400 men joined him. He was killed. And all his followers were scattered. The whole movement was a failure. After that, at the time of the census, Judas from Galilee appeared and led people in a revolt. He too died, and all his followers were scattered. We should keep away from these men for that. We should leave them alone. I can guarantee that if the plan they put into action is of human origin, it will fail. However, if it's from God, you won't be able to stop them. You may even discover that you're fighting against God. The council took his advice. They called the apostles, beat them, ordered them not to speak about the one name to Jesus, and let them go. It's strange how they saw him, leaving them alone. But they were going to kill him. The verses before this, they, they got the hold of him, and they were going to kill him. So compared to that, I get a, just a beating and get out of here with pretty mild, I don't know. But Gamaliel had some sense. He, you know, he was the most highly regarded scholar. It, it was like he had, I don't know what's after a PhD, but in, in the college, it's like he had all of that about the law of Moses. Now, on page two, Gamaliel was the teacher of Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul. Uh, and Acts 22, uh, beginning with verse 2, is the account 
uh, of where Paul is trying to address this crowd in Jerusalem that had been busily trying to tear him to pieces. Let's read verses 2 and 3. Then Paul continued, I'm a Jew. I was born and raised in the city of Tarsus in Cilicia and received my education from Gamaliel here in Jerusalem. My education was in the strict rules handed down by our ancestors. I was as devoted to God as all of you are today. You see, but Saul, while before he was converted, led the first great persecution of Christians. He didn't just participate it. He was the leader of the whole thing. And you can read that in, earlier in the book of Acts. But let's read verses 4 and 5 now. I persecuted the people who followed the way of Christ. I tied up men and women and put them into prison until they were executed. The chief priests and the entire council of our leaders can prove that I did this. And in fact, they even gave me letters to take to the Jewish community in the city of Damascus. I was going there to tie up believers and bring them back to Jerusalem punish them. See, as the Apostle Paul tells of his life before his conversion, he describes his former self. He describes who Saul of Tarsus was, how he thought what he was all about. This strict, strict sect that he talks about of the Jews was called the Zealots in our language. And it's like a, a the total sports fanatics. There are people who, in Louisiana, who paint tigers all over their house and all over their cars, the Louisiana Tigers or LSU, and they they get crafted cars that look like tigers, and they dress up in tiger suits and and paint the inside walls of their house with the tigers. They're a, we call them a fanatic. And a zealot was a fanatic who believed that you had to defend the Jewish rules just like when Moses was talking in the wilderness. If a person did so and so, stone him to death. That's what yeah, he believed. In. And, you know, the first time we read about him, the first martyr, Stephen, is being put to death. And I always wondered why he only held the clothes of those that stoned him until I found the reason. The reason is, by Jewish law, you could not stone someone if you didn't personally see with your own eyes the offense. He wasn't a member of the high council. So when Stephen was testifying to the, to the council and they got angry and decided to stone him, Paul was on the outside, not on the inside, Saul of Tarsus. So the best he could do was hold their clothes while they stoned him because they were the witnesses. Anyway, one of the original apostles was called Simon the Zealot. And it probably doesn't mean that he was zealous as an apostle. It probably means he got the nickname when he, like Saul, was a zealot Jewish man. And yet he had been converted to Christ during Christ's ministry. They were extremely fervent in protecting the Jewish law and customs and believed in the very things that Saul did. And so Saul said, I believe in them, therefore we need to do them. Let's wipe out these horrible people that are trying to damage or do away with the Jewish law. Simon changed an apostle of Jesus Christ. Saul later changed and became the apostle Paul. At Saul's conversion in Acts 9, Jesus said, when Paul said, Who art thou, Lord? 
he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Remember Gamaliel's advice? You leave these men alone. If they're not of God, they'll fail. If they're of God, you can't stop them. And you might be found fighting against God. So all of a sudden, Saul of Tarsus is made absolutely aware that that's what he's been doing. He's been trying to persecute the Son of God. When I was in college, many students, the popular thing, went about quoting Bertram Russell, who was an English atheist. Bertram Russell decided he knew everything, so he wrote a book called The Development of Western Civilization. And it was supposed to include all about everything. And it was, in fact, a book about Bertram Russell's conclusions. And one of the things he concluded is that there is no God. I had word of honor. I had a professor in economics whose textbook was Bertram Russell's <laughs> The Development of Western Civilization. Ah, uh, a lot of kids said, oh, well, there's no God. Bertram Russell says so. Yeah? They didn't even read the book. It was a huge book. Their only source of so-called knowledge about God or the church was what Bertram Russell said about it. What a sad way to learn about things. Some lessons, just a couple of lessons to think about the alien. Number one, a teacher can be wrong. The alien didn't accept Christ. He was the greatest scholar of his time in their religion. He didn't accept Christ that we know of. No matter how highly regarded, no matter how influential, any earthly teacher can still be wrong, especially in his viewpoints about God, Christ, and the Bible. Many in our country not only don't believe in God or the Bible, but they also actively fight against God. There are more and more atheists becoming aware that their tactic has been to fight against God with religious <laughs> zeal, like Saul of Tarsus used. You know, discrediting anybody that claimed they believe in God, putting the bad mouth on them keeping them out of important positions in science and business, things like that. And they're realizing that it's very true. They've been acting just like they had a religion. Their religion was an anti-God. Well, teachers can leave people ignorant of the most important thing in life. Hosea 4, 6 and 7. The whole of this in Hosea is talking about people that were supposed to be leading and teaching the Hebrew people about God and the Jewish law, but instead were teaching them how to sin. Let's read verses 6 and 7. I will destroy my people because they are ignorant. You have refused to learn so I will refuse to let you be my priests. You have forgotten the teachings of your God, so I will forget your children. The more priests there are, the more they sin against me. These were Old Testament priests who thought they qualified under the law of Moses to be priests of God, yet they weren't doing what God required them to do. And they were letting the people be ignorant. Instead, 
they were blatant sinners. Like so many people in our society, when they get real rich and real powerful, they just decide they can just do anything they want to do and who's going to criticize them? And in our lifetime, we've seen so many people go into such corruption and destroy their lives. Uh, well, this was actually in the religious movement of the Hebrews in the Old Testament days. I will destroy my people because of a lack of knowledge. Shouldn't people study about it for themselves? I mean, it, it affects the eternal destination of my soul. You know, but we live in an age where people would rather just have some silly opinion about the ghost in the closet or the aliens that visited me last week or two weeks ago I was taken to the moon and, and watch stuff like that, you know, and argue about that. Why worry about something really important like, like do I have a soul? And is there a God and will I spend eternity somewhere? Blind trust can lead to the blind Blind. Jesus said that in Luke 6.39. They are the blind leading the blind. When I taught at the academy, there was a teacher there who took her third grade, grade students, second grade students out every year. And if you watch, you come across it. They put blindfolds on them. And they were willing to cooperate, so they really couldn't see. And they would hold hands, two people, both on the playground big playground, blindfolded, and one would lead the other. And she'd keep them from walking into the swings and stuff. But they would trip and fall down, or you know, walk into a bush, you know, whatever. They, she, she said, the blind are terrible at leading the blind, but when they don't know where they're going. That's what Jesus meant, and that's what happens when teachers who should be educating people about the most important leave that out for every part of the equation. Where knowledge must begin according to God. Proverbs 1 to 7. Let's read that together. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Stubborn fools despise wisdom and the discipline. Well, I guess there must be a lot of stubborn fools. You know, I'm stubborn. I imagine I'm foolish too, but some people want to major because they don't even want to go over there and learn the fear of the Lord. 2 Timothy 3.15, let's read that. And that from a child you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Timothy had an advantage in life. He had a faithful mother and grandmother who taught him the Jewish scriptures. And you could study the Jewish scriptures and see the coming of Christ in them. So one lesson is that a teacher can be wrong. It's foolish to blindly trust a human teacher. We, we need to find some way, the best we can, to try to learn just the truth. The second lesson is don't fight against God. Even Gamaliel counseled against fighting against God, even though his student Saul did exactly that. A few quick examples. It did not work for the Philistines. In 1 Samuel 17, we read about the giant Goliath who was killed by David. David used a slingshot and round stones from the river to slay this person, no matter how big, 10 feet tall, who could have taken him and squashed him like a grave. But he wasn't going to let anybody curse his God. And the Philistine was slain, and David cut his head off. Goliath's own sword. The troops of Israel then followed the Philistines and they wreaked havoc among them. It 
didn't work against the Philist with the Philistines to fight against God. Page four. It didn't work for a sorcerer named Elias in the time of Paul and Barnabas. There was a governor on Cyprus who wanted to hear Barnabas and Saul. Elias, a sorcerer, tried to prevent it. And Paul said, Acts 13, 10, let's read that. O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert right the right way, Lord? Of the Lord? And the Lord blinded Elias. Fighting against God won't work for Satan. There are many that say in the book of Isaiah, where it talks about Lucifer, that this was Satan. I kind of leaned that way myself. And he thought he would ascend on high and take over the throne of God, but he was cast down. But in Revelation 20, 9 through 10, we're given a preview of the end of Satan's efforts to fight against God. Let's read verses 9 and 10 together. And the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and the brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so this verse not only tells us that that's where Satan's going to end up. If we read before a few verses, we read that at the end there's no great thing called Armageddon. Satan is released to get some people together, and God has got tired of fooling with it, and so he sends lightning down, burns them up, and throws them in hell. That's it. The other thing it tells us is that what happens in hell is that souls are tormented day and night forever. There's lots of other kinds of belief that people want to believe. Ah, you can believe. You can believe whatever you want. It's like you can believe there's no God. But it doesn't change reality. E, fighting against God won't work for people. Revelation 21, verse 8, let's read that. But the fearful and unbelieving and the and murderers and fornicators and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The kids at the academy had a little song about Revelation 21a, Revelation to all liars have their part in the fire. <laughs> you know, uh, it's a good one to know because lying is rampant to overwhelming in our society. Uh, but people, uh, you know, you can have to do a lot of studying. It doesn't mean somebody that gets afraid because they hear a noise in the night, but it's people that are fearful, of, too fearful to follow God. I don't know, something like that. But here's not an all-encompassing list, but a list of a lot of kinds of people that are going to give up on all their sin and just spend eternity with Satan. Fighting against God is not a good plan. So we're going to finish by, real quickly, thinking about spiritually winning the battle. We're going to read Revelation 21. One through seven. Now, it's on the back of this sheet we started with. Let's begin. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a 
bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to him that is thirsty of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. That's the way God tells them. men tell it however they want. Everything from God could send anybody to hell. If you just have a kind thought for Jesus once in your life, you're saved. Or if you only believe, you'll be saved no matter how bad you live in life. People make up all kinds of stuff like that. And they may have a teacher that tells them that. But teachers can be wrong. It's a big problem. Teachers can be wrong. We ought to check it out and read like we've been reading this morning. In Mark 16, verse 16, Jesus said to the apostles, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. In Galatians 5, 16 through 26, there's a whole discussion about how we're to live as God's children. All kinds of things we're supposed to stop doing or get away from, and all kinds of things we're supposed to develop in our life, like the fruits of the Spirit. In Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, there's a discussion of putting on the whole armor of God. We're to put on around our middle the verbal or supportive truth, the breastplate of righteousness, have our feet shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We're to hold a shield of faith in front of us and have our on our heads the helmet of salvation. Use the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, See, not Gamaliel, the Word of God, and we pray in the Spirit. And that's what we need to be able to resist all the false teachings, all the false ideas, the self-serving ideas that people want to have that God says that's not reality. If we want to learn about God, we need to read in his book, not in a book that some man wrote about saying, let me tell you about God. Because we have a book in which God tells about himself, and whose writers were breathed into by the very spirit of God that they might tell the truth. Why should we then seek to learn the truth from a mere mortal person when we have a God who will educate us with truth. Saul of Tarsus got his education, meaningful education, as he approached Damascus. And a great light appeared and blinded him and he fell from the animal. And as he lay there, he said, Who art thou, Lord? He said, I am Jesus thou persecuted. If 
we were walking toward Damascus today, riding a donkey. You know, it won't happen that way. But what would Jesus say to us? Would he say, I appreciate that you're trying to follow the truth and serve me as you should? Or would he say, you're doing it all wrong, you're persecuting me? Or would he say, you know, you got some things right and some things I hope you'll keep improving on. If, if you want to read my word, <laughs> on what you need to be doing. We never know the hearts and minds of those with us. But in the Bible, we read that wherever the gospel went, men and women believed and repented and were baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of their sins. We read that the Lord added them to the church, his church not man's church. And, and we read that these people continued to try to learn what God wanted to teach them, except for those who couldn't abide, didn't want the rule of God, had to go after their own ideas and cause trouble lots of places. Hopefully, something in our life will click a little bit like it did for Saul of Tarsus that day as he neared Damascus. And the little light will come on and we'll say, oh, I've got to straighten out my life. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, not, let me get back up here. Number 705 has been selected as an invitation song. 705 can help you with your soul salvation. We ask that you make your needs known as we stand and sing. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right, holding up his banner in the thickest pride, listening for his orders, ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus serving him today? Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side. Master, here am I. Who will follow Jesus in life's busy way? Working for the Master, giving Him the praise. Earnest in His vineyard, honoring His laws. Faithful to His counsel, watchful for His cause. Who will follow Jesus? Who will make reply? I am on the Lord's side, Master, here am I.
prepared by the Lord. Let's read that together, and then we'll ask Brother George to lead us in a closing prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Let us pray. Dear Lord, again, we thank you for allowing us to gather here this morning to worship you here in spirit and in truth. We thank you, dear Lord, for allowing Brother Ed to be with us this morning to guide us in the teaching and understanding of your word. Thank you, dear Lord, for allowing us to receive this word. And we pray, dear Lord, that our faith has been strengthened and renewed. We pray, dear Lord, as we depart from here this morning, this afternoon, that you will be with us and that you will keep us under your protection. And we ask the Lord that you will also watch over those that are dear to us, that you will keep them safe, and that you will help us to return here on next Lord's Day. We pray the Lord that as Christians, we will always strive to live our lives according to your word and do what is pleasing in your sight. We pray the Lord that when the day comes that we are called that we will be a part of that chosen group to be by your side in your kingdom of heaven. Thank you, dear Lord, for the sacrifice of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. For through his sacrifice, we have that avenue of forgiveness. This prayer we say in Jesus' name, in the name of the Heavenly Father, amen. Amen.